When I first got into this space, it was because there was no transparency and you don't own the money in your bank account and you don't own the securities you think you own. And when you saw Lehman, you saw that there's a few collateral assets and there's all this leverage and it's a big game of musical chairs for who gets a slice of the collateral, right? Nobody owns anything. Blockchain changes that because it's provable who owns it. You can give permission to rehypothecate them or you cannot, right? So this it's a game changer for that. But even in terms of trading, it gives you a whole new set of stuff you didn't have before. This episode is brought to you by my friends at FinChat.io. FinChat is the complete stock research platform for fundamental investors. Beyond having all the standard financial data for more than 100,000 companies around the globe, FinChat tracks company-specific segments and KPIs on over 1,500 stocks. You want to see Amazon AWS's revenue over the last 10 years? FinChat's got it. You want to track premium subscribers for Spotify? They've got that too. You want to see how many stores Lululemon added in China the last quarter? Yes, FinChat has it. FinChat has everything you need to easily track and manage your portfolio. And starting today, you automatically get two weeks free of FinChat Pro when you sign up. So go to finchat.io. That's finchat.io and try it out. If you end up loving the platform like I do, you can use code TWF at checkout and get 15% off any paid plans. Welcome, everybody. Howard Linson here, fresh coffee, Adderall, and you are on Trends with Friends. Um, this has been a most requested, well, not JC or Phil, a most requested thing is maybe JC and Phil won't show up one day and you could talk to Raul Paul. We'd like to ask about his tanning skills, his sockless ability. I call him Sockless Joe Jackson. He hasn't worn socks. In 35 years, he's he's chiming in today from Little Cayman or Big Cayman? Big Cayman, Grand Cayman. All right. You are uh, – welcome to Trends with Friends. You're going to have a good time. I'm handing over the uh, moderating right away to to Phil, uh, Dr. Phil. He's, he's our own Dr. Phil. Um, he, he doesn't like talking to crazy people. He knows they're out there, but unlike the real Dr. Phil – he doesn't like engaging with those people. He just stays above the fray. And our own Cuban Missile Crisis. One of uh, Filippo or Giovanni unplugged your stuff for a minute there, JC. One of the twins. Oh no, they're 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 somewhere they're somewhere else right now. It's all good. It's just me here, man. Just having some technical difficulties. I'm just trying to look at my charts. So many monthly candles. Oh Can my we god! Talk about that. So many monthly oh my candles. God. All like, right, Phil, take it away. Monthly, we're going to get into monthly candles. It's fantastic. But where I want to start. I just want to go, Raul, what's up, man? It's great to see you. I just want to go right to you. You posted something the other day or just very recently about the massive adoption curve of uh, crypto and Bitcoin and uh, relative to uh, the internet. And so I just, I, I would, a great way to start. I mean, this is profound and I'd like you to just talk about it a little bit. So I discovered this chart back in 2020. Um, and what it is, is the number of active wallets in crypto, crypto.com measure this, versus the, I guess, active IP addresses of the internet. And I always thought, well, this is a network adoption model, the same kind of thing. It's an adoption of a technology. And I wonder what they look like. And I put them over each other. And what we found was that, obviously, because the internet was the rails that already exists, the adoption of a new technology that uses those rails is faster. And it's actually twice the speed of the internet. So if you can get your heads around how big the internet was for all of us, this is happening at twice the speed. It's, the, it's driven the fastest appreciation asset of all time. The compounded annual returns of, let's say, Bitcoin is about 150% a year even with 80% drawdowns four times in the middle of it. We've literally never been given an asset like this with an adoption like this. And going forwards, if we just assume that the rate of growth just matches that of the internet from here until the end of 2025, we end up with a billion users. And if we extrapolate that out to 2030, we get to 4 billion users. So basically, this is a pervasive technology 
that's going to take over all of our lives in ways we don't really understand. It's not just going to be about investing in cryptocurrencies. It's just going to be the underlying rails of transactions. And by by users, do you mean wallets? So again, wallets much like is, IP addresses. Yeah. So the, what is there, half a billion? We were talking this weekend. There's a half a billion wallets out there. That's right. Half a billion wallets. Now, people say, well, they're not all active and everyone's got multiple wallets. I hear you. That's all a mid-curve take. Basically, it's growing massively. And if we looked at IP addresses, how many IP addresses do we all have? Mm-hmm. We have multiple. So it's just the it's just an easy way of referencing the growth. And it seems to be accelerating, right? Like I'm 58, uh, JC. Well, there's so much like that to dive in here. Like even Matt Levine's post, Matt uh, Phil at some point. But Phil, go ahead. What what else did you want to? Uh, or is there? Well, the only other thing I'd like to highlight, and I'd love to get everybody's comments on this, is just. The way people think, people are slow thinkers, right? We're not efficient information processors. We're not, uh, you know, we're not supercomputers. We're more like old, slow Commodore 64 computers. We're not processing. We're not get. We're not wrapping our heads around this very simple chart that we're seeing. And I would just, you know, like that is that is a pervasive. So, uh, Phil, the reason dynamic. we can't, the reason we can't, is we can't think in exponentials. We just simply can't as humans, right? I mean, every single person I know, except a few, got wrong Google, got wrong Amazon, got wrong Tesla, got wrong um, Apple. All of these things—they're all network adoption models. Everyone got them wrong because we can't understand exponentials where growth compounds, and we're seeing it yet again with AI. This is even faster. And humans just can't extrapolate this rate of change. In it's it's that we keep seeing it. So for me, even though I've done well, and, and so this goes to what we've been talking about for a year. All these people that, uh, and by all these people, I mean the people on the All In podcast. But but those people that they represent, they confuse their their perceived understanding of this as their own genius, right? Their projecting on you that they understand exponential growth because they were smart enough to work at PayPal or they were smart enough to work at at Facebook. We all, the little peons of the world, uh, us, who I'd rather be, you know, and I don't say that negatively about us, who can admit that what Phil just said is kind of a psychological thing just because we're humans and what um, uh, um, Raul just said about exponential growth. There are a few people in the world that I've talked to in my life Fred Wilson being one of them, uh, and there's a few others, Brad Feld, understood exponent. They went to MIT, they understood, they were saying the word network effects, you know, Mark Andreessen, and Chris Dixon, they were saying these words, uh, and I was just, okay, if they're in, I'm in. That was my response to network effects. And my first experience with network effects, and I keep getting them, or exponential growth, is Robinhood, right? Um, because I was an investor. And I thought I was overpaying at an eight million valuation because, oh my God, brokers don't brokers don't grow exponentially. But mental model for me was seeing Snapchat and Twitter, and I said, well, Robinhood could do the same thing. And then when it happened, when it actually happened, I was an early seller. Meaning, once it got to a billion in a in a year and a half, I'm like, oh my God, like a billion. That was like what I my projection was for ten years, right? And That was my first experience with like truly in my own portfolio seeing it. If the really important thing is crypto right now is $2.7 trillion industry. It'll probably finish this cycle at 10 to $15 trillion. And by 2030 or so, it'll be $100 trillion, right? This is the largest, fastest accumulation of wealth in all human history. It's as simple as that. That's what that chart tells you. Now, what everybody does, and how would you explain, there is a bell curve. And you want to be on the left of the bell curve, which is actually the same as being the Jedi master on the right of the bell curve. Everybody in the middle who overthinks it, it's simple. Number go up. That's the whole crypto thematic that you need to know. You can either do all the deep dive, and I must have done 10,000 hours on this, and you, I might be at the right side of the curve sometimes, but I don't mind being the left either. Just don't overthink it. The moment you overthink it, that's when you get yourself into trouble and you start not seeing it for what it is, you see it for what you want it to be. So I just posted a, the last, you don't have to read Chris Dixon's book, but you should. And I was just posted the last sentence of the book 
first of all, great book. Honestly, have have uh, your kids read it to you, uh, JC, or put it on Audible. But the last I read it already. I read it before you. I'm the one who told you to read it. Remember? Okay, whatever. So (laughs) I thought there'd be more pictures, but I said, uh, "What seems late is actually early." This is a fucking great line. Like again, like this is what makes people like Chris Dixon great. You can read the whole book. Or you go to the last line and go, he just gave you all the signal you need. And right? that is a typical left curve, right curve answer, right? It's because what he's saying is, look, numbers going to keep going up. The adoption's going to keep going up. Mm-hmm. You don't need to know anything else. You, That's why it's so easy to get involved in this. Well, Raul, can I? I well, got a question. Uh, yeah. I got a good, JC, I got a good go. Raul question, mm-hmm. right? So go you on. got you got your Lindsay questions, and those are great. Now you get the JC questions, right? So I think it's important for investors of all kinds to get perspective on where crypto assets fall within the whole global macro landscape. And you just mentioned that 2.7 trillion in crypto assets today. This is compared to 15 trillion of gold. Uh, Silver's about 2 trillion, just for perspective. US stock market's 50 trillion. Global stock market is more like 80 trillion. Bond market's about 130 trillion. Am I pretty close to those numbers? Is that about right, bro? Yeah, exactly. And then global derivatives are 1.4 quadrillion, which is quadrillion, fun. which is fine. Nice. That's too many commas for me, bro. So hang on. I when need, you put I things in perspective I like take that, an right? Keep up. There you go. Taking a step back, right? So again, 2.7 trillion only for crypto assets, which 2.7 trillion and zero might as well be the same thing, right? Just to put things early. in perspective. We're early, <laughs> right? It's nothing. It's zero. It's a it's a rounding error in the whole global macro sphere. And then when you break it down into Bitcoin's only a trillion, right? Um, you know, you look at some of these things are like five billion, ten billion. That's nothing. So, is that part of the bullish thesis that it's so small and irrelevant that it, it can only get bigger? Like, is that part of the thought process here? Yeah. And listen, if you go to the ludicrous thing that Paul Tudor Jones mentioned a while ago. And Stan Druckenmiller talked about is 80% of Bitcoin holders don't sell ever. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. They're in cold right? storage. I mean, this, this, yeah. I mean, and it's the same with Ethereum, with the staking and everything else. So your actual supply is 20% plus the miners. The miners keep getting halved every four years. So you've got no supply. So that's, that's um, you know, 20% of the two. Um, let's say of the entire asset class, 2.7 trillion, is actually available to buy. You bring something like an ETF and things go bananas, right? The more people who adopt it, the more the price rises. Also, the really key thing is, I don't know if you guys have ever seen the chart from Fidelity about the risk reward of assets. It's brilliant. So there's this big white page, all Fidelity branded, and here's a cluster of all of the, here's the NASDAQ and here's gold and here's oil and here's all of that. They're all clustered in the bottom. Then there's a blank page, blank page, blank page, blank page, blank page, dot, Bitcoin. (laughs) It's a fucking alien asset class. (laughs) We have never, ever had an asset class with this risk reward over a long-term time horizon and this performance in all of human history. So here's a question. I'm so glad you're here for this question because I think I've been making this up, but you'll confirm or deny that I'm insane. One of the specialty, well, I think we're very lucky to have it, this asset in many ways. In 1999, when everybody was making money, the money was in the real world, which created its own recession and inflation because Wall Street people went out and bought Porsches, overpaid for this, overbought that. That was that bubble, right? You remember? They would go, you know, the movie Wall Street. In this movie, yeah. when no one's selling, so the rich people aren't selling, or the early adopters, the farmers, whatever we call these people, the industrialists, the, the aggregated, the, the hoarders, aren't selling. The phenomenon about digital so far to me is it's self-correcting inflation, meaning as people liquidate a little or, or get more on the speculative curve, the money just disappears because all mem coins go to zero. So really, it's its own universe that if that money was coming back into the real world, we'd have such fucking inflation. You wouldn't be able to buy a Porsche or a Lambo because, but in this world, they go further out on the risk curve and buy shit coins and meme coins and get scammed and do whatever. And the money just literally vaporizes on its own. And how does that affect your thinking of global macro? 
Y- yes and no. Because the, the log chart over time keeps going up, right? The wealth keeps building. It goes from a billion dollars to $10 billion to $100 billion to a trillion dollars, right? It just keeps building. But your point is really crucial is very little leaks back into the economy. Right. And less and less, I think, if I were listening to Fred Wilson, it's like, once you have a certain amount in the digital world like me, I get scared and I brought some back, you know, some Solana back. I got scared. I sold some multi coin. That's just I'm a Canadian. Like I just I didn't wasn't real to me because I wasn't using it. This time around, I'm playing with the stuff and the stock to its audience and meme coins and, and, so, and building on Solana. Why bring that money back this time? So, right. if I'm right that this is the fastest, largest accumulation of wealth in all human history, right? If it goes to a hundred trillion, to JC's point, this is the S and P is worth. Fifty trillion dollars, or the U.S. stock market, entire U.S. stock. That's a hundred years of accumulated. It's, it's value. mostly S and P, Raul. <laughs> yeah, it is. Okay. It's a hundred years of accumulated value, and we're going to double that in a decade. It's like this is La La Land, right? The amount of money that's going to get made here is La La Land. So, what do they do with the money? Um, I was speaking to a very famous hedge fund manager yesterday, and he asked his son this. And this guy is deep crypto. And his son is too. And his son's like his son's like 25, 26. He said, what are you going to do when you make your millions? He's like, well, I'll keep it in crypto. He's like, but when you take any money out, what will you do? He said, I'll buy property. And he, his dad was like, well, do you want to buy a super yacht or anything like that? He goes, no, it's a waste of money. So <laughs> like, I'll buy property because it's an asset. And I will buy NFTs. And that's what Rom said last week. I mean, honestly, the show, like we have access to the, like, the, like, and then, you know, you're a little more famous than Rom. Best, like Rom said this suntans about- suntans in the world. Yeah. Well, listen, suntans a sign of, of, uh, of uh, creepy success. So hang on. But so real estate go up too, because, and Rom was talking about it being inflationary to real estate. If you're going to do one thing, and I would do the same thing. I never thought I would have two homes. I have two homes. They're small very small footprint. Not that that means anything. It's just how I'm comfortable with my wife living our life. We don't want a lot of stuff. But in a world that this, the only thing that I would buy are are other properties, right? And even and then, like- In specific in Very specific, places, specific work, very specific. And you can work specific. anywhere now. Mm-hmm. So you're not forced to live in metropolis X or Y. Mm-hmm. You get the choice, if you've made money, to live anywhere and like i can live in little cayman or grand cayman or and because of the leisure world that we live in and everything's acceptable like for example my new favorite brand is asrv which is like a high-end uh local san diego fitness slash leisure wear life wear fashionology company i can just put that each that brand can be worn in any location so you need very little to go amongst your your properties around the world, and we, everybody. Can we bring this same. back to data? Sorry, Phil. Okay. This is right up your alley, Phil. Data and Howard Lindzen. Data, right? Raul. Data. Can, Raul, can you speak to the transparency of crypto markets and the public ledger that is all of these different blockchain networks that I would only kill to have in the bond market or the equities market? Or the commodities market. I mean, it's all there. Can can we talk about that? Like, this, isn't that like the biggest thing here? Like the transparency. Well, because when I first got into this space, it was because there was no transparency, and you don't own the money in your bank account, and you don't own the securities you think you own. And when you saw Lehman, you saw that there's a few collateral assets, and there's all this leverage, and it's a big game of musical chairs. But who gets a slice of the collateral, right? Nobody owns anything. Blockchain changes that because it's provable who owns it. You can give permission to rehypothecate them or you cannot, right? So this it's a game changer for that. But even in terms of trading, it gives you a whole new set of stuff you didn't have before. Like funding rates are just brilliant because you can see in real time what you'd have to get from a prime broker at Goldman, you know, how funding rates for a particular stock are trading. But here you can see it in real time you can see when it's liquidated. If you add that with a bit of technical analysis, you've now got a really nice system to figure out, okay, have we got another leg lower or is this over? Stuff like that. Not to mention, you can see the wallets. You can see the wallets, Raul. You can see Paul Tudor Jones's 
personal portfolio in real time for all intents and purposes because you have the yep. track records of all the wallets so you know who's good and who's not you got the real smart money the real dumb money it's all there like if you see a meme coin that you want you could see and, who else is buying it or JC, who's not buying it jc imagine when they start training ai on this and what, what signals what, are you going to get out of it so just to dive a little deeper here because now i have a headache because i'm nervous <laughs> so AI I love the transparency. Is very, love is very good at pattern recognition, seeing huge data Correct. sets and making sense chart of it art. and creating probabilistic outcomes. They'll be the best chart artists in the world. It will come from AI. Yeah, we'll of see course. about that. And all human knowledge is, you know, recorded in the, these AIs. But you start training on blockchain data plus technical analysis, it will come up with extraordinary understanding. Raul, JC, I didn't, JC, I didn't Raul. mean it as a slight. I mean, the best technical analysis will shine oh, no, because they have balls. the best signal. They'll have the best no, pattern listen, recognition ideas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Raul, what, I think what you're missing here is that the, the analysis of the blockchain data is technical analysis. Yeah, right? Right. We're you analyzing, the it's, the, it's the study of the behavior of the markets and its participants yeah. literally in real time. It's no different yeah. than studying price and volume. Down to individual level. Like the ETF right now, we don't know who's buying it, but with right. every Bitcoin, we know every single wallet mm, yeah. that owns it. Mm. Who okay, sold really it? quickly, Who we're gonna go to the Bitcoin monthly chart. We're gonna pull up JC's chart, but I'd just like to make one quick comment for all the dimwits out there. I'm a dimwit, not a smart guy, really a simpleton. And the only thing that I have to say about it is like, listen, let's say you bought Bitcoin at 10,000, right? Let's say you bought one Bitcoin for 10,000. Goes to zero, you lost $10,000. Goes to a million and you have a hundred bagger. And so buying and holding and forgetting about it and not thinking about it, not thinking about all the data, not thinking about all of this uh, macro philosophical, very interesting uh, conversation, forgetting all that, sitting over here, you're not the ninja, you're not the midwit overthinking it, you're just this dumb guy, and you're just holding it, and number go up, and you forget about it, come back to it in five years, and you've made you know, 10x, 100x on your money. Okay, monthly chart, JC. So this is a weekly, just to, this is, in this case, it's a weekly, just to look at the, the other one we're looking at is the monthly. In this case, it's a weekly, just to see that, you know, we're back to those former highs where last time uh, Bitcoin got slaughtered. So from a more tactical perspective, you know, for me, the trade was to go long against 31, target back to the former highs, and then we'll reevaluate. So I think that's what this process is. Ro, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. For me, it's less about the uh, supply side of the equation and the Bitcoin having itself because what, 93, 94% of the Bitcoin already has already been mined. So half of that is not really that much to me. It's more the demand side of the equation. Now all this new institutional money can now uh, by mandate be allowed to participate in these markets. At least a lot more of them can. Um, so in my opinion, that will speed up and accelerate the absorption of that supply faster than it would otherwise. Um, but I'm curious to see how long do you think it takes us to get finally break out and start seeing 80, 90, 100? Like, how long do you think this absorption of uh, overhead supply is going to take? It's pretty common around the all time highs that, you know, people take some chips off the table. We're seeing long term wallet addresses taking some chips off the table. It's pretty common. Yeah. Ahead of the halving. Then it normally goes into what I refer to as the banana zone. And that's when you get the real <laughs> price action. So the real price action hasn't happened yet. No right. banana zone? When, We're pre-banana zone? Aren't you, when when, when? does it start? When? <laughs> well, it's either... I mean, look, we're wedging into a... It's a wedge right now, right? That'll be the last chance saloon. Mini so wedge, whether that, mini wedge. A mini wedge, but that's it. That's all you're going to get. And after that becomes unbuyable, and it, how long does that wedge take to complete? Does it complete this week? Does it complete in two weeks' time? Doesn't really matter. So you think soon, though? You think soon? No, he's just saying oh, God, when yeah. it does, it doesn't matter. And he's but saying soon, not to yeah. time and He it. thinks it happens soon. I don't know, because if you want, if you show the gold, if no you show one the knows gold it. chart, but let's be when honest. gold came back, it took longer. I'm, okay. I'm curious. Listen, let's none of us know. Right. right. <laughs> let's just be honest. This is, the pure, this is where we all will sound dumb. I think what Raul is saying is when it happens, it's going to happen. Um, you know, but to let be me show you a chart. I'm going to share a chart. 
just because it's the best chart in the world to understand this. Right. Bitcoin to me in crypto has just been a hedge against my own, um, just like I did with Web 2. It was a, at least Web 2, I was participating in. It was so obvious to me with YouTube. This is much harder because you have to have a wallet. You actually have to, uh, which is much more technical than just making a video and posting it to YouTube and sharing it on Twitter. This is about really trusting your own security, um, really having confidence in your own ability to like keep a secret in many ways. It's also a very, it's a very adult way. It's an adulting thing for young people to understand. This is with with great uh, opportunity comes great responsibility. Like this thing triples, the stakes go up of you like doing it right and you you know managing your money. This isn't like calling your financial advisor and you're having a backup. This is like. And this is that's so what the, what the opportunity, here, not the uh, mass. Go ahead. This is the banana zone, gentlemen. <laughs> okay, so this tell me what we're seeing. Cycle. This is the banana zone. So what happens at about this point in time, what we call crypto summer, we have this little shuffle around the all-time highs, and then everything just goes bananas. So I don't care whether this is tomorrow or in a month's time, because to Phil's point, the number about to go up uh, and don't overcomplicate it. Everyone will overcomplicate this. They'll be looking at weekly charts, daily charts, hourly charts, you know, tick chart. Just forget it. You've, you should have a year plus to make a lot of money. This, this, this crypto market is the biggest gift retail investors have ever been given yeah you don't need so a bloomberg don't you don't need don't wall street journal you don't need cnbc you don't need, any, don't need, don't need market need timing anything. yeah you don't, don't need, need you don't to need. trade around positions don't need to get in and get out no you just you, don't, you, you just you, you just don't hold. Need anything you yeah, need to respect to markets stop. you need to respect a security you need to respect your the people you trust to help you set this up properly you need to trust yourself it's, i'm gonna I, listen technology. i love the three of you guys I, gotta, I love the three of you guys. I'm taking the other side. As bullish as I've been of Bitcoin for real positions, real positions moving forward, I got to see it. I want to see the breakout. I'm happy to wait. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy you. to pay Me a little too. bit more. I'm take, I love the three of you. I love you guys. And but we're going to all party together. Guys, yeah. It's going to be great. Okay. I, I mean, I'm going I'm, I'm to be, I'm being more, I'm gonna be the old man conservative. Show me. Let me see. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, and that makes sense too. Look, with moves like that, you don't need to be over cute. Again, you can buy the breakout, and sure, it might even retest that, but it'll be fine. Next, Phil, move us on to you. Got let's move it along. Okay, so we're talking about what's working here, right? And we've had a great move in in the crypto markets and Bitcoin specifically. Now we're seeing all of these uh, uh, ancillary coins and sort of the beta increase. Let's talk about what else is working. Let's talk about the macro picture. Let's talk about all things real. So we're seeing incredible moves in commodities. JC, you posted a chart recently on sector performance since March 1st. Yeah. And what we're seeing is we're seeing, and what you pointed out is that XLE crushed it in March, while X, which is the uh, uh, energy, energy ETF, while XLK, which is the tech, tech ETF, actually underperformed, was actually red in March. There's the chart. It's a beauty. Uh, give us some color there. Yeah, I mean, listen, the 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 this is this is the bond market crashing, and I want to hear Raul's take. This is what happens when the bond market is crashing. People are like, JC, the bond market's not crashing. Uh, you know, of bond market volatility so low. Yeah, well, I see a bond market crash, but so I want Raul's take definitely. But this is what's driving this, right? This isn't crypto, which is a two trillion dollar nothing. This is a hundred and thirty trillion dollar asset. This is the bully. And, you know, what's happening is that energy, utilities, materials, these are the sectors with the lowest weightings in your favorite indexes. Your favorite indexes don't have any of these stocks. You know what they have a lot of? They have a lot of the worst performing stocks. They have a lot of the, the, the stocks that are, that are having a hard time keeping up with these names. And this change in market dynamics really got going in February. You saw it in March, obviously, but it really got going in February. And it's really being driven by the bond market, in my opinion. If you scroll down to, to the one right below that, uh, you could see that uh, crude oil futures are making new highs. 
and you're seeing the uh, inflation-protected treasuries outperforming nominal-yielding treasuries. So the bond market is telling you inflation is going up. Inflationary assets are going up. Uh, the bond market goes down every day in terms of long duration. Raul, this is the big bully in, in the room. This is a bond market crash. How is it not? No, it's not. It's really simple. It's the ISM has gone above 50. It's the business cycle. So technology and crypto are driven by liquidity cycles, real assets, value stocks, commodities. They're all just the business cycle. And the business cycle is going up now. So these things have been playing catch up. They were dogs. Now, as the economy um, starts re-strengthening, these will do well. And so everyone got left behind because they didn't do anything last year. And now they should do really well. And they should do really well in macro summer, macro fall. So they should just keep doing well over time. They'll have periods where they'll outperform what tech did because tech, you know, went off to the races to start with. So I think it's very consistent. And bond yields are just a function of that too. If the economy's strengthening, then bond yields tend to rise somewhat. Um, but the Fed can't let them arise too much because the Treasury needs to refinance all its debts. And we've got this massive debt payments coming up. So, And you think it's as simple as that? that you way. think it's just as simple as that? Just go with it. But if bond, economy, bond yields keep going up, stupid. commodities keep going up, gold's breaking out of a 14-year Silver just broke base. Out. Silver just I keep broke being out. told that rates are going to go down. I keep seeing rates going up. Rates just Bond rate, market. Yeah. I mean, bond market has been getting I have an, I don't have an issue with that. I don't think it makes much of a difference at this point. You know, when the business cycle picks up, yields always rise. It's the economy, stupid. they always the same with commodities. Commodities lead the inflation cycle, but 63% of all inflation is the super lagged owner's equivalent rents and wages. Those things lag. Right, but, that's, but, that's the government, but that's the government data. I'm talking about the actual data. Raul, for our entire careers, when stocks are under pressure, money flows into treasury bonds as a safe haven. But over the last couple of years, we haven't seen that at all. That's no, a major dynamic got, shift, no? Because we've got trillions and trillions of debt to refi. Oh, maybe, four, but what well, we're four seeing years ago, Four years ago, we were all locked up at home. And I was doing panic with friends with Howard, <laughs> right? And we had the record amount of stimulus and government spending the world had ever seen. All of those interest payments are due. So of course the bond market's going to dislocate because you've got ridiculous supply. I mean, stupid supply. But it's and something it we we're not used to, and I think a lot of investors are not used to it. I think there's a, I think there's a, there's there's exploitation there because investors are having a hard time wrapping their heads around the fact that the treasury bond market is not the safe haven that we had grown accustomed to for so long. I think, and I, I think, think I think that's here to stay. No, and that's one of the reasons why gold is breaking out because you've got to finance this debt. And also one of the reasons why the Bitcoin ETF had the largest ever inflows of any right. ETF in the shortest period of time. I think you agree. My, my, my next question is, what do we do? Sorry, Phil, to interrupt, but I just got to ask this question with, with JC and, and and obviously you, Phil, too, and, and, and Raul. Here. What do we do in a world when I saw Web 2 and I'm like, oh, my God, this is my chance to build, C you know, to change how I how I see the financial world. I'm tired of listening to Wall Street Journal and Bloomberg and, and I can't afford a Bloomberg and I, I hate CNBC. What I didn't predict, of course, because I'm not that smart, is that instead of one CNBC or one Jim Cramer, we'd have 100,000 of them. I, that mental model didn't work for me. Same as exponential and everything else. So in this world, where even the people I trust the most have a different view on the same trend, uh, you and JC, like have you on the exact same show, you agree fundamentally about everything you just said, except underneath it all, there's a little difference. How do we deal with the tech bros that now all of a sudden are macro experts who have never really had to think about <laughs> macro, right? And they're now advising millions of people and no one, you know, relatively few watch our show. How do we how do we rise above that noise? How do we get the good advice out to people about what you guys just said? Because I'm having a hard time like putting it all together because none of the fundamentals make sense. Even a guy like Matt Levine yesterday was writing about Trump and saying maybe fundamentals. And he's right. He's just so caught up in his own head, even Matt Levine, that he can't just have a laugh full time and say fundamentals never really mattered. It's only an 80 Sometimes year you old. just have to laugh. Right. right? It's Raul, only an 80. Pearl, he can make me laugh, but he won't laugh himself, Matt Levine, because 
he's still anchored to this 80 year lifespan of fundamental analysis. It really just came out of nowhere. There was no fundamental analysis until people, until the SEC demanded quarterly numbers. So in a world that fundamental analysis is relatively new, and now we're getting back to pure art, pattern recognition, and technical analysis. He he just said this yesterday, March, April 1st, not on April. It wasn't an April Fool's joke. And he used the Trump SPAC as the flippening for him. Like, and he's he's so on it, but so far behind at the same time. It's 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 blowing my mind. I take it this way. You know, there's a recognition uh and I think this began, you know, you, you can trace it back, but I think one prominent example was the whole meme stock phenomena. But there's a fundamental recognition that's occurring right now because of our access to noise and because of our access to information that they're, that we're all being fed bullshit and it's an opaque universe that we're living in and that we don't really know what's going on. And so any clarity that we have in terms of the blockchain and really being able to see real time what JC was talking about before, we could see what the what the whales are doing real time or any time that we're fed bullshit. It's just to point your finger. Hey, that's bullshit. And you want you 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 here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go buy dog with hats because what you're telling me is as much Graham and Dodd is as much hat, bullshit as anybody else. Dog with hat, and uh, I'm just going to go buy the A dog with the hats, and and uh, <laughs> and just forget about anything you're saying because it's all bullshit, and I, I call bullshit on you. And so as a as a response, you know, we saw the same thing in the early 20th century with Dadaism, which everybody looks at Dadaism, that art movement, as it was like this is just ridiculous. But underneath it, it was a political statement that was being made. So when you had a golden toilet or whatever the piece of artwork was, it was a statement being made about the society. So I think there's something underneath in the meme coins, something underneath in meme stocks that is pointing or underneath that where even with the uh, Trump, you know, the golden shoes or whatever, that's just this idea of we're just po pointing bullshit at everything. This, we could have an hour long conversation about memes, which I think we should do at some point. But it was with me, I think. I called you and I just needed a download, no? Yeah, but I think we can do a, I think there's a show actually to talk about yeah, this. Yeah, we'll do it for sure. It's really, it's really important to understand that memes rule the world. Religion is nothing more than a meme. Everything is memes. That's how humans communicate with each other. All value is memes. Gold is a meme. Everything is a meme. Um, okay, so that's fine. But let me give you a number that I think people need to understand. Americans spent $110 billion on lottery tickets last year. There's a one in 300 million probability of getting the payout of a small payout, of let, smaller payout of let's say a million bucks. It's probably one in 20 million. But if you go to the meme coin casino in a trending market, you will, your probability is probably 20x better. So if you are a 25 year old, you have no chance of buying a house. The S&P is too goddamn expensive for you to buy it. You can't have, Here's your opportunity. You can make 100x, 1,000x, 10,000x. We've seen them all in the last two months. And so, of course, it's going to attract people, and it's rational behavior because they don't have a way out. So even, Phil, your example of Bitcoin going from 60,000 to a million, that's a 14x. That's not going to move the dial for somebody with five grand. So they have to take risk. And the beautiful thing about the technology this time, and I said this, there's 2017 on stock tips when Bitcoin messages surpass spy messages, which might have been a short term top. But to me, I wrote about this is a sign that it's not going away. The too hot, too loose. Reddit sees the future. Twitter's real time. Stock Twits stock is drafting just behind that, the community. So that was a message to me. Then during the crisis, the crypto crash, the stable coin depegged, I think it was USDC. And I said, if this gets back to, if this doesn't implode and gets back to zero, we've now crossed, you know, USDC was trending on stock. It's the first time it had ever happened. I'm like, this means something or nothing. And if it, if it, if it destable, if it stabilizes back to par, we're in a new paradigm, right? Stable coins are here to stay. That was two years ago. 
This year, it's been meme coins. And the reason they each time it gets more interesting is because if you're trading meme coins or, or tokens on Ethereum and your gas fees, you know, if you go to fill up your gas one day, it's $80. The next day, it's $200. It's not very efficient. But in this era of Solana and maybe base with Coinbase, which is, you know, I'm still trying to learn, you've now taken the fees to zero. You don't need Bloomberg. You don't even need Discord anymore. You need Deck Screener. You don't need the Wall Street Journal. You don't need Goldman Research. You don't need to pay DraftKings. You don't need to deal with what Gensler is saying. You can make a thousand X without and be in the one, the 0.001% of knowledge and continue to do this and don't even have to tune into anybody. And it's a team and it's a team sport. Team sport. It's a lot of fun. And it's it's also a team sport, but it's also a war. It's also a war. Yes. Yeah. And it's super risky and everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. There's everybody no, knows like, the game they're playing. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, no, it's nobody doesn't think and that that's most of these the newest. So we went to Bitcoin with a crossover. This meme coin weekend on Star Trek's where everything trending is a funny meme coin isn't Maybe a short-term top. I'm not going to argue with that because I'm not a timer. But it definitely long-term says these are not going away. We and, flipped and over to this new world, so which is all pattern recognition, out. all technical, all price, all team-based, all fuck the man. Donald J. Trump's just a marker for what the real stuff is, which is built on Salon and maybe base. And wait till Taylor Swift has a token economy or sports teams properly, you know, this is this this is where it's going. Yeah. Right. We're going to a world where we will have equity in our culturally important things to us. In a world of AI replacing jobs, this is the future. You can't see it yet because it's super speculative and it's super early. But what we're doing is we're creating little mini groups of tokenized economies around ideas, memes, culture. We're tokenizing culture. Um and as you rightly say, Howard, this was a moment that people look back on, much like they'll look back on NFTs from last cycle. You know, NFTs in the end are going to be every single ticket, every single contract. Mm -hmm. But that was the start. It happened to be art. No, and this is the start. It happened to be a dog with a fucking hat. Yeah. But I've know, been lucky fine. to just know that. I mean, again, this goes to the show and us having the internet and, and using these things to put the four of us in the same room. I met you through um, Subneat. And obviously, I met JC through Josh Brown, and I met Phil through Fred's blog. I mean, this is not like we grew up together. We all have have become friends through price and through, well, probably through price and just through common sense, but through random networks of people that didn't exist. But in 2006, you know, maybe with, with Phil, it was around Yahoo Finance and the Amazon ticker back in 97, 98, yeah, But it 99. blew up after the financial crisis, Howard, because of what you said before. People finally realized you can't trust the media. They missed the whole thing, prancing around all these sell-side analysts. You can't trust the banks and Wall Street because they've, they've caused this whole mess to begin with. Whether that's true or not, that was finally what everybody kind of realized. So instead of worrying about what the journalist says or what the Wall Street research says, why don't we just go to the source? Why don't we just go to Fred Wilson and see what he has to say? Why don't we go to Barry Ritholtz and see what he has to say? Why don't we go to Howard? Why don't we go to Phil? Why don't we go to JC? Why don't we go to... You could just go to the source. You don't need these arbitrary intermediaries anymore that you can't trust. Cryptocurrencies are a lot, a lot like that. You can just go to the source. It's all there. Hmm. I'm uh, enjoying this. Phil, what, what was the next on your your agenda? Uh, we're going to go, we're going to do a quick thing. You know what? We're going to go right to your best idea here and now. But before we say that, I just want to say something to everybody out there who has, you know, who is not 23 or 25 and who has amassed uh, a, 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 a savings or a small fortune is put away money. The mean coins, you know, we're talking about this stuff and it's at a very high level, but they are going to be incredibly volatile. They're going to crash. They're going to come back. Most they're go to zero. They're, most of them will go to zero. They're insanely speculative. We joke about dog with hats. We've done it like three weeks in a row on the show. It's a great logo. It's a great name. It's just fun. But these, many of these assets will go to zero. So don't take like a huge chunk of your money and go, oh, you know, the Trends with Friends guys are investing in this. I'm going to invest in but, this. But let me give you one. Like, this is America and you can. It you is can. America. Go right ahead. Blow Still. everything. But I'm just saying that it's not for the faint of heart. And there will be, 
you know, loss aversion, you know, uh, Kahneman just died. He was the father of loss aversion. Loss aversion is an emotion. It makes you freak out. You freak out. You get scared and anxious because you think you're losing. So I don't want you to be, you know, I don't want everybody to just go put their money in these assets and, and think, I've oh, I've been well, using the, th- the thesis of don't fuck this up. Don't fuck this up. It's just keep 90%. If you're in crypto, keep 90% in the world-class top assets and then do what you want with the 10%. Which is what, Raul? Which, what are the top assets? For me, it's, it's, it's Bitcoin, ETH, and Solana, my bet is Solana. I'm quite risk-seeking. What about so punks? Been, is, not, is punk not a Punks not and NFT, punks are art, punks culture. Yeah, yeah, yeah but it's all, they're all NF- tokens, but they're all tokens. Yeah, that's my ETH. That's my they're ETH exposure. They're all tokens. Yeah, but that's my ETH exposure. Aren't aren't you talking about the Chris Dixon book? He'll tell you. They're all tokens. I agree. And I own punks and I own all sorts of stuff. That's that but that's based on the ETH economy. I own the ETH economy, a small amount of the Bitcoin economy, and a I think the official measurement would be a shit ton for me of the Solana economy. Yeah. That's how I've done it, and, and, that's how and a few I'm, other things. I, I, that's how I'm doing it. I still think. I mean, I'm so happy to have stock twits back because I still think we're early in this switch to meme economy. And guys like JC, Phil, and and you, and Ron, like the people that I get to talk to, um, even though we're old, kind of get it. The the what I was going to say is with what makes Solana so interesting. Is that is it more like the Visa of the digital world, or is it Mastercard, or do am I thinking about how do you think about Solana, Raul? Because if it's your if it's your biggest idea, like how do you go to sleep at night when it's down thirty percent and understand that you're fine? If you think of Ethereum as Android, you'll think of Solana as Apple. It's a closed economy. It's closed, right? Okay. And it also because it's not built on the. Ethereum virtual machine, which is a much larger network. So what you've got here is a whole different operating system. Like I use Apple, other people use Android, fine. Or PCs versus Macs. But what it also happens to be is is very fast and cheap. So it means it's very useful for this kind of stuff, like meme coins or things that require velocity. Could that be tickets in the future to... Train tickets and event ticket. Could it be anything? Yes. So I just think of it as a very efficient technology that's about to get more efficient with the Fire Dancer upgrade. It'll be stupid fast. Great. But it doesn't mean it replaces one or the other. It's just earlier in its adoption curve, so it's going up a lot as it's finding its place within this new global infrastructure of blockchain technology. And it's proving itself to be now a very important player. So I just sleep at night knowing that, that if there's going to be a retail chain, it's probably Solana because of its attributes. Because it is right now as well. It's also, it is right now. So you're betting on the one that's working right now. That's right. Yeah. And base is cool. Can that change in the future? Maybe. Base Base is is cool. cool. Coinbase has just been such an innovative. Amazing company. Amazing. When you compare it to Robinhood, again, I love Robinhood as an early investor, blah, blah, blah. But how can you compare it to Coinbase? The guy's like a legend. Yeah. No, and that, the quality of people there is extraordinary. Phil, really is that good. your favorite idea right now? Right here, right now? Just My Solana. favorite idea. Like, wait, like, I'm a dimwit, right? Just, yeah, just what would buy, you tell me to do? Solana. Go buy and hold in Solana. Yeah. So Solana currently is, call it 200 bucks. It's just a bit below that. You know, the probability if it just follows previous bull cycles, it, even if it's a really stunted cycle it goes to 500 and if it's a really good cycle it'd go to 2000 i mean yeah okay that's plenty for everybody yeah and so you hope <laughs> you, you hope for anything. 120 and you just put in some bids below the mark you wake up one day with a 120 got filled at 2 a.m you because... don't want to be oh, I, I don't think you should be cute no i'm just saying i don't think you should if you want to be cute you just throw in some bids you own some but you throw in some bids oh, yeah. below the market all right yeah. so that's solana yeah. jc what are hey. you looking at so what I was going to tell you is that I, I'm going to take the other side. I'm going to be cute here. Um, I, I agree with everything you guys are saying. Like, uh, I, I wish I didn't agree as much, but I agree with literally Raul, everything you're saying. Uh, Lindzen, I never thought I'd say this, but yeah, I agree with all you guys, except the cuteness part. I got to see it. If you want to put the first chart up there, you got Solana and Binance. We already looked at Bitcoin back to the former highs. I see Solana and Binance in a very similar sort of situation. Ethereum's still below those former highs. So I like the tactical 
nature, a, a tactical approach. And by the way, I'm not like one of these people who's been bearish and it's a bubble. And now I'm saying like, you know, be somewhat cautious. I've been the opposite. I've been incredibly bullish and all over this. And we've done very well and talked about it on the show, obviously. But now where we are now, I need to see it. And I hope Raul's right. And this thing breaks out in the next couple of weeks. I hope it does. This is, it could this is take just time, this, this is just time horizon differences, right? right? I'm just talking about the next 18 months. You're talking about over the next month or two. Can we? When, I'm, I'm wondering when, when to put on a huge position, right? Now, today, yeah. when to put on a huge position. And for me, I'm going to be the conservative guy. And I'm going to be like, I'm going to be the guy that I need to see it. And by the way, there's, you nailed it. It's all about time horizons. 99% of all arguments on Twitter would end immediately if both parties just understood that they were talking about different time horizons, right? So yes, agree wholeheartedly. So that's, so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to be a little more tactical. And my trade is commodities. If you own the NASDAQ 100, you have zero exposure to commodity stocks. You have no energy, no materials, no financials. If you own the NASDAQ, you don't own the stock market. If you own the S&P 500, you're getting 3% energy, 2% materials. If you own the Dow Jones Industrial Average, you're getting no materials, 2 or 3% energy. Investors are not exposed to these areas. Interest rates continue to rise. Um, the bond market continues to tell us that inflation area assets are going to do well. So we want exposure. Gold just broke out of a 14-year base to new all-time highs. This Bitcoin stuff and the crypto stuff might have something to do with this. Raul made a lot of great points. It, that might be the case or it might not be the case. What I'm saying is that it doesn't matter. Real assets with real market capitalization, with real, like real institutional value, um, I think investors are have little exposure there. I'm, I'm talking about real institutional investors have no what's exposure. The, there are, there are the no single, ETFs. What's the single best one? If you had to distill it down to one commodity trade, which one is it? Yeah, I like an oil gold combination, really. You know, an energy gold. I, I, I fight. It's a great question, Raul. And I ask myself and all my colleagues the, that exact same question. Um, it's difficult because I want to be in metals. I want to be in energy. There's probably some agricultural areas, but it's more of a mixed bag over there. Um, you saw what uh, Coco have, has done, obviously. I think beans are probably set up as well to do maybe something similar. But I think the easier trade, obviously, gold, if we're above all these former highs, you can own as much as you want. Uh, gold's already making new all-time highs. Bitcoin is not, just to be clear. Solana is not. Ethereum is not. Oil is not. Gold is, right? So I like to be in the things that are already proving that they can make new all-time highs. And I will be the first one to be jumping in Solana and Ethereum and Bitcoin when they start to do the same. Gold is the leader. Let me. Uh, I haven't been able to say that in a long I'm time. Gonna, I'm going to hop, but let me give you my fave idea. And I think it's it's <laughs> yes. um, it's not an idea. It's just time, right? I've, I've spent the last six months trying to get off Twitter and completely off the mobile apps. I think if you're using Twitter uh, for anything but for for fun and a few people, you're you're wasting your time. The world has moved on. Um, Elon hasn't. Elon has his own plan, but you following Elon around right now is probably the worst bet that I see. Finding your new network to understand this stuff, whether it's real old JC, you know, with Matt Levine saying it yesterday, we've now entered, you know, I've long talked about chart art. We have now long entered this moment where if you're not a CMT is worth more than a CFA, um, we're well into this trend where intermarket has broken out over market expertise, right? You better have a really tight network of people because it's a team-based game and it's bloody. And so I'm a little old to play in this game, so I'm back reading. This is the first book I've read. I got to be honest, I'm not a book reader. Like I'm not ashamed to say that because I don't think many books are worth me reading in this era. The last great book I read was Shoe Dog and before that, Andrea Agassi's book. So I'm very particular about what catches my eye. And it's easy to hate on Andreessen or because they've made so much money and they've been wrong with some axes or whatever the shit coins. But directionally, I'm all in on my time on StockTwits, this community, narrowing my community, flipping my community to people that have a little bit more of an open mind and are open to different tools. So it's time to start playing with new tools. Reddit and Twitter aren't going away, but those are not the tools that deck screener is or that, um, you know, uh, uh, Solana is. 
And these communities have been forming for four or five years. We're behind. They've been having events around the world for four or five years. And so I have a lot of catching up to do. So like the energy trade, the oil, I agree with everything you guys just said, but those trades are small in comparison to me getting up to speed and building a new network, which is what we're doing with Trends with Friends. So, so I appreciate you guys coming on. And my best idea this week is to is is the same as it was. XLE, gold, like no one owns these things. And it's been QQQ for me forever. And I'm really doubting my QQQ over SPY thesis because QQQ does not mean crypto, right? It does, I guess, with NVIDIA. So it's like you can't give up on QQQ. And a few others. And a bunch of others. But at the same time, having no exposure to this other stuff is, is a little bit scary in a world where you see rising prices and these trends in gold and now silver breaking out and coca, all these weird things happening and closing borders. And all, I don't know. Pretty interesting time. Pearl, want to speak to that? How investors, you know, having like a sleeve, you know, where you have to go one step further. This isn't a keep it simple, stupid thing because there's no S&P 500 for commodities because commodities don't trade that way. Any thoughts there? There's a stupid trade for everything, right? For crypto, for energy, for everything. And so, JC, I just want to thank you because about four months ago on this program, we were talking about energy and I was asking you and commodities and I was asking you the easiest way to play it. And I said, how about XLE? And you were like, well, XLE doesn't really cover it, but it will correlate. And I went out and just bought some XLE and put it away. And that gave me that sleeve. And in fact, I was buying some more like two weeks ago when you were talking about it, you know, you've been continuing to talk about it. I just buying a little more, not a lot, but just a little more to give me that component. So you could keep it really simple in any, any of these markets. And if you're watching this and you're our age, you know, you're a little bit older, you're me, me and Howard's age, you're in your 50s and you don't know what to do with crypto, you could just go out and buy some of the ETF. I mean, I know the purists aren't going to love that idea, but it's still beautiful. I mean, if it's going to go up, that asset's going to go up. And if the listen, if the if the ETFs become, you know, valueless, we're going to have a, a lot bigger problems. There's going to be wars and going. There's on. There's another that. way that we can put all of our views into a really simple strategy. It will definitely work over time. By GLD ETF, by the Bitcoin ETF. And go to the beach. You'll be fine. And go take a walk, right? Go to the beach. Exactly. You'll be oh, by the way, you should add a motherfucker. I'm, I'm coming here. Raul got me into the motherfuckers. Uh, I, I bought my first one. I'd like to buy all of them. I think that guy's, <laughs> that guy's I'm fucking I, I genius. I like MFers. I like MFers yeah. are fucking. I got one. They come up in the background occasionally on that screen because I've got one as well. I'm what about the me bits? You got any me bits? I'm fucking all your I other don't. shit. The motherfucker spoke to me. That's my new religion is the motherfucker. I think Mebits would speak to you too. You look more like a Mebit than a mother, to be honest. Okay, we're <laughs> wrapping up. It was incredible. It's spring, everybody. Get outside. That's my recommendation. Go find a 5K and like train for it. You know, I'm going to run a 5K in May. So you have to go jogging or something. Just get yourself outside. Uh, Raul, thank you so much for joining us. We are going to have you back again to have that specific discussion, the meme coin discussion. No socks. <laughs> no <You're> socks. <laughs> oh, well done. I finally got you. You're buying MFers and you're not wearing socks. You're finally not a boomer. <laughs> oh, he's a boomer. Adios, guys. <laughs>